traveling around the country talking with people about what God has done for them. In a world where hopelessness abounds, it is wonderful news to hear and to know that we have a Heavenly Father who cares about us individually and who is well able to bring us up from a pit of despair, as was the case for Olene, who is now going to share with us her testimony about what God has done for her. Tell us a bit about the life you were living prior to your relationship with God. Um, I think I have to go back to my childhood because a lot of my kind of inferiority complexes did begin there, but were heightened through um, unpleasant relationships. Mm. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a path you follow when, when you feel that way at such a young age. You kind of are attracted to that type of path without any guidance or anything. Um, so, yeah, I was very reserved. Mm. Um, and and I had an inferior complex, and mm. I think it was because of the responsibility that was laid on upon me at mm. ten years old, because both my parents had to work, so I had a lot of responsibility. I had to make sure the you know the washing was done before I went to school, come mm. home and do dinner, and take care of my um, younger siblings. There were four of them, mm. three brothers and a sister, and that's a lot for mm. ten years. Yeah you know and to carry yeah. it through so i left home early i left mm. home at 16. my first job was at george courts in the mail order department that was okay but then um i i went for three more interviews got the whole three about two years later and i chose a, a Howie fox and partners in simon street um, which is an architect's office it was a really good job um, but two years later i fell pregnant with my first son aaron mm. and so I left that job and I also left um, the father of my son when he was two because he wasn't, he didn't really have paternal instincts or anything. He was, you know. Up until Aaron was eight, we were on our own. Now I used to sew clothes at Petticoat Lane and just do various odd jobs. Mum and Dad supported me, absolutely. Mm. Um, 100% they supported me. And then when I was 27, I met my husband-to-be. Well, you know, I was deceived. I mean, I didn't really know him because mm -hmm. I didn't know that he was high, you see. Mm -hmm. So I figured, like, I, he came across as, like, sincere and gentle and, and, a, and, and, a, and a really, you know, charming. He was charming. And, he's, and he was okay-looking, I mean. And so we got, you know, we started living together. Um, mum, mum was, mum was really sad. She didn't want Aaron to go. We, you know, mm. we had the front room at my parents' home, and she didn't want Aaron to go at all. But at first, it was really good. It was, and then, it stuff was being exposed with my second son. Mm. I didn't know that he'd been on heroin all, all that time. Mm, okay. and when, when I was 27 and then I had Dawson at 29. I didn't know. And I knew about mm. the marijuana, but I didn't know about the heroin. Mm. And so that's where it really began. That, right. um, that life that was contrary to how mum and dad had brought me up. And I knew it. I found myself lying to get rental homes. I found myself lying and covering up. And on our you know, we decided to get married. I just thought that might make a difference to our relationship. And it was like living against the grain and allowing all these influences to come into my life. Like people that you just didn't know. And then he, he, he got involved with going up to Coromandel and ripping off plantations. And then where we were living, he'd dry them out. And I was just so, every knock at the door, and that added to my stress. I I knew that I was losing control. Yeah. Mm. Here. Mm. And then um, we moved up to Coromandel. That's when, like, mental abuse, put downs, useless, hopeless, came in. But never in front of anyone. Mm. It was always after they left. And no, who would believe me? Because mm. everybody's friend. 
mm. would believe me. No one would believe me. Um, and then his family moved in. That was horrible. And I really went into the shell, into my shell then. His two brothers moved in, their girlfriends, mm. his sister and her two boys. It was just a DOS house. And mm. I'm really fast. See, so that's what I mean about, it was all against my, the grain of how I chose to, to live. So you talked about taking medication, but you also talked about a persecution complex. Yeah. They didn't put me on any at first, the family, mm -hmm. my ex's husband's family. Can you imagine not sleeping for weeks on end, getting really, you know, where am I? <laughs> yeah. Um, it wasn't until I came back to Auckland that my mum did something about it and I went on to psychotic me medication. Now, where does one start? You're just a walking zombie. Mm. You know you're not right. You know you're not coping. It doesn't make any difference what they give you. And you still don't sleep properly. You just kind of blank out. Mm. But there's nothing. Mm. No. Yeah. It's a bit like alcoholic amnesia. Drinking until you just like that. So it did nothing for me, mm. medication. So when did things begin to change for you? He wouldn't go, right? You have to appreciate he wouldn't leave. Now, when I came right, I worked for Cigna Insurance, which is an insurance company, went to tech, got my associateship in insurance. When I came right, um, he'd got a job with my brother plumbing. Things were going okay, but nevertheless, the drugs and the alcohol were still there. Mm. But I was pregnant with Amy, so that was fine. And then we went to live in Australia, away from his family, because they was following us around and just there. They were, you know... It was okay for a while also, and I um, had a job at St. Vincent's Private, but they were a bit upper class for me, so I went to, the, I got a job at the University of New South Wales, best job I've ever had. And then all the drugs, and, and I was drinking more because I had to balance the books, and I really hit the alcohol, yeah. and mm. I just couldn't stand him. I just felt this, so the all the feelings had come in. I mean, he was, wasn't doing anything in particular, but it just, I just didn't feel the same. Mm. It's sort of like, the only way I can describe that is the rock came in. And I was drinking heavily, so we split. And then, then I went into a woman's refuge in Darlinghurst. That was a horrible place. It was just horrible. It's not free. They take a portion of your benefit because I was on the benefit at the time. Amy got trench mouth in there. We're in there for six months waiting mm. for state housing to come through. Wow. Now that's when it, I really took a spiral downward. Mm. You know, when you hit rock bottom, there's nowhere else to go but up. But I didn't know that then. Yeah. So that was yeah. my lifestyle. Mm. I'd just get up in the morning, clear the empty beer bottles on the table to make room for Amy and Joshua's breakfast. Mm. Take them to school and come back only to start drinking. Everyone drunk in the in that area, mm. and you know it, it was just too easy. Yeah. If you didn't have any, your your friends did. So I came back to New Zealand because I had to. I had to dry mm. out. Yep. Amy was ten then. Mm. I had to dry out and just try to live a normal life, and it wasn't easy. My sister-in-law rang me after several months being back in New Zealand. And she said, quote, Oleen, do you want to come to church? And I'm like, that's another world in my mind to me. Because, <laughs> true, yeah. this is 20 years ago now. It's just like, and I'd hesitated. And then she went, do you want to be saved? I didn't even know what she was talking about. What does she mean saved? <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, I preferred alcohol to anything else, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. So I did. I just thought, what have I got to lose? Well, really, what have I got to lose? Mm -hmm. So I went there, went up for the altar call, and I just said, oh, you know, Lord, take me. I mean, it wasn't a sort of a long, dragged out salvation prayer. I just said, take me. Mm. You know, oh, take my life. Yeah. Take me. They, they, yeah. they were basically my words. Mm. And then um, people may be under the wrong impression to think that your life becomes a bed of roses when you mm. commit your heart to Jesus Christ but it's the opposite because all sorts of feelings rose up out of me mm. I you know 
I mean, I'd go to bed and I'd go over everything Clary did to me. And, mm. um, <sighs> That's all right, take a moment. So, Olene, you were telling us a bit about the abuse that you went through. How did you come out of that? You don't really come out of it. You know, you, 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 you never come out of it. There's no mm. one that can help you. And they also presume and cut and draw their own conclusions. They hear snippets. But unless you've been through it, you don't know domestic violence how. You may not be near them physically, but mm. you're in, they're in your life, in your head. And I, mm. after Aaron, Aaron took his own life at the mm. age of 28, that was hard. And that is where I'd had the altar call, I'd come to the Lord, but I know now that God couldn't leave me with that intense unforgiveness, mm. hatred, wanted revenge. This is after Aaron, you see, and mm. it all came back. Even though I'd given my heart to Jesus, mm. all those thoughts came flooding back. The humiliation, the put-downs, embarrassment, the same way he spoke to me, he spoke to him. I'm not blaming him. We live in a fallen world, but God cares more than we ever realize mm -hmm. that he, he cares about what's happening, not only to the Christian, but also to the people that don't know him. He's there. So I used to, <laughs> I was staying in my parents' place. I used to go over and over in my mind every night what I wanted to do to him. And I went over and over what he did to us. Well, that's not good, darling. That's mm. no good. So I didn't sleep. I didn't sleep um, for nights on end. So I had another breakdown. You see, it was always there. It's always lingering. It's just a, just a subterfuge. It just covers. Pills just cover. So it was mm. always there. So mum took care of Amy and Josh. And then I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say in comparison to now my life took a turn for the better. Because um, you can't just say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the Lord and everything's okay. It's not like that at all. So I went to a mm. Bill Sabrisky meeting. My mum came with me. Anyway, he said something. He said, um, there is a lady in the audience whose mother's Christian name is Elizabeth. Will she come forward? And my sister-in-law was with me. And mum, she was there. They're both, And I'm in the middle. And they both look at me. And I'm like... So I go up, and he was just asking me some questions, um, and my ex-husband came up, and he asked me, have I, had I forgiven him? I said, no, <laughs> no, not at all. And he said, get down on your knees, I'm not a hypocrite, I can't heal you. I refused, even though he was prompting me to say that I forgive him, I wouldn't. So he prayed over me, and eventually I did forgive him because I knew that I had to. It's part of the requirement to be <laughs> in the Lord. <laughs> it wasn't easy. So I, when, I, when I actually, actually I, I found myself recommitting my life to Jesus because the churches I went to, I might as well go to the RSA or a rock hall, you know? It was, there was no change in me. Right, yeah. It was just a social event. So I kept mm. recommitting my life to Jesus because I knew there had to be change. Mm. So I stopped going to church after a lot of unpleasant experiences. Like, and so, you know, I was very disappointed. Mm. Wow. So I read the Bible. I read the Bible. and re I love the Old Testament. From mm. cover to cover, I read the Bible. I took out a uh, correspondence course. Did it for years. Didn't know it was Seventh-day Adventist, believe it or not. Didn't mm -hmm. know. But it was parallel with everything I'd been reading, Prophecy, State of the Dead. Eventually I did forgive, it wasn't easy, but God has to clean out, clear out all that garbage before he can fill you with himself and, 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 and his Holy Spirit. People say, oh, I trust God, I trust God, but I really do. Yeah, yeah. Because he had to deal with all of that hatred. If I had seen my ex-husband on the road, I was in the car after, this is a week or so after Aaron, mm. I would have run him over, chopped him up, and put him down at waste disposal. It's not very Christ-like, eh? <laughs> but I would have. Even in the Lord. 
because I don't like injustices. I had enough, you know, yeah. even in the law. I just wanted, I just wanted to sort things mm. out. That's how I felt. Mm. But now, mm, no, no, because with Aaron, when I came back from Australia with the ashes, it was a beautiful send off. We were supposed to fly economy. But the lady at the check-in check -in counter, she ripped our tickets, you're going first class. And when I look back in hindsight, the, the grace, the, the mercy, the healing had begun on that plane. Yeah. Because we were just pampered. Mm -hmm. The service was beautiful. And, and when I came back that night, I had the ashes next to me. Unsure what to do with them then, but I, slept, I, I was asleep. And this voice said, wait, uh, look up. So I mm. looked up. Just in the right hand corner I looked up and there was an octagonal stained glass lantern and a gold cross horizontal and I put my hand up you know to just touch that gold mm. <laughs> this is only above me but I couldn't move you can't mm. move you want to but you can't but you know I had the best sleep I'd had I don't know for years it was as if the Lord had wrapped me in a cocoon and I had a I had peace yeah. But I knew God had Aaron on his mind. You know, sometimes, mm. you know, he'll take you through the flood. He'll mm. take you through raging winds, mm. fire, mm -hmm. but always through love. I mean, <laughs> Here I go again. That's very devastating for you. Um, I'm sorry to hear that those things have happened. So you came back from Australia and you brought your son's ashes back with you and you laid him to rest. Yes. And then what happened? Well, after um, eight months, and you know, this was really hard for us, mum passed on. She just was sitting talking to dad on the couch. She had a cerebral hemorrhage. Wow. So we had mum's funeral, which married tradition is they all come around to your house, but you just want rest. You just want to be alone. They were there all fit there for three days, so I felt that that wasn't comforting. And then eight months later, I was looking after Dad. Then he died. Well, I was a mess. I was very close to Dad. Mm. Um, and I bolted my gates because I'd had enough of mourners. To me, they're just, they make you feel worse and you make them a cup of tea and you've got to do the dishes. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. And besides, I was crying too much, mm. far too much. It was me and Joshua. Joshua was helping me clean the fridge. And on the rubber bit in the freezer, on the bottom, in the rubber bit were a whole lot of ants. He goes, oh, mum, look, ants. Mm. And I go to two my little things, you know, through tears, bashing my bread that I was making. And then God spoke to me audibly, like he was in there. And he said, that's what you are, Oline, an ant. And um, I took offence, and I didn't speak to the Lord for two weeks. And I was always talking to him. And then one day, I was outside, um, I was outside, and I observed an ant carrying three times his body weight. And I went, mm. "Wow, go to the ant, you sluggard!" <laughs> that was a compliment. Wow, yeah. Yeah, it was. But he also said, "I remember getting a cut." This is during the same time period getting a cup out of the top cupboard and he said, you, and this was very authoritative and stern, have to learn agape love. So, and I knew, I knew that, but, you know, I know I've forgiven. I have, I look at people now um, and, you know, from my past, mm -hmm. they've done me wrong. Yeah. And it's, there's, there's nothing there. I don't feel any um, hatred. I don't want to get revenge. Yeah. I get over things very quickly. My mind has moved. I don't dwell on anything. So how did you actually get to that situation where you could forgive people? I was on my road to forgiveness. It was a long road. It didn't have to be that long. It wasn't until first light came on mm. and then they had various teachings on forgiveness. Mm. I mean not just the meaning of forgiveness, but like, for instance, an exercise like you get a bit of paper, mm -hmm. and I actually did them, mm, okay. and you put, because I had unforgiveness for my mother as well, 
Mm. She was always yelling at me and I had a lot of responsibilities. So this was a combination mm. of unforgiveness for uh, lots of different people, family members, molested mm. at 5, 12 and 14 mm. by friends of the family and uncle. God brought all that up and I was able to forgive. So I didn't Amazing. exercise. What I'd done to hurt them, what they'd done to hurt me. And guess who was the longest? Was it with my mother? Mm. My list. Ah. So you just feel this when you when you confess it and you know it and you understand it, you have the knowledge. Yes. That you are not innocent. Whew. It's just like somebody's tipping. Um, you know, it's just like invisible washing of water. And also, I can't remember the gentleman's name. He wrote a book on forgiveness, and 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 John Bradshaw interviewed him. He helped mm. me tremendously. Mm. And the word. Because I like prophecy and I like, um, so you're talking I don't about like, yeah, I'm talking about the, the teaching, Bible. the Bible. So I got so immersed with what I was studying, with my, my, my Bible study correspondence courses, and picked it up with first sight, carried it on with all their, um, their courses, their Bible study courses. I'm still doing them today because I really think you need to. Mm. There's too much, too many distractions out there. And also you don't want to be, uh, and I've been there, you, you want the truth. Yes. You want the Bible and the Bible only. Mm. You don't want to listen to their opinions or what they get from it or how they twist and use the scriptures. You know, I'm not naming, I'm, this, you know, I'm not naming anything, but these things happen. They twist the scriptures to their own advantage. If they're preaching a prosperity message, they'll go through even the Old and New Testament for all those relevant scriptures. So really, I really believe my, my walk took off with First Light. So you've been talking about how you were watching First Light. How did you actually come across it? Well, I was flitting through the channel and what caught my attention was clarity of speech, a Bible actually they were holding, and I was impressed with First Light because it was nothing, it was the Bible and the Bible only. Mm. The First Light have, um, have just confirmed what I've been reading, backed up by all mm. the correspondence courses that First Light offer out. And each time I finish a course, they send me an Ellen G. White book, which she is just amazing. She's amazing. Um, she, she puts poetry to the Bible for me. Oh yes. Because she does. Mm. And she gives you a deeper um, insight on how we should walk. We'll never know how much he loves you mm. so you get to know him. Mm. And he created you and me. So he knows us better than, you know, um, we know ourselves. Mm. He knows us. Well, after all, he created us. Created us, but you see, people in my walk have been trying to make me something I'm not, and I just retreat to Jesus. Yeah. And He comforted me with a beautiful vision with Dad. He's He's when I had to, when I'm in a difficult situation, He'll give me a vision, but that vision gives me strength, and I'll step out and I'll do it. So that's why I love the Lord. I mean, I don't really care about what the world offers. There's nothing there. I've dissipated everything it offered. Mm. It's amazing that you have been through so much and yet here you are today, healed by God. We haven't even talked about the fact that you've been through cancer. You have such an amazing testimony. What would you say to someone who is struggling like you have? Honestly, I would say give Jesus Christ a chance. Mm. You don't have to live shackled in this world mm. and, and, and captive mm. because the Lord is um, only willing with open arms and I'm really serious because I'm as I'm saying this I'm relating to little incidences and and how he's come through economically for me and mm. you know financially and his visions and speaking to me and mm. and so patient because mm. I was very um, rebellious and like as you will see through my testimony I held a lot in and I wouldn't open up mm. but he's taught me to, mm. to yeah you know and if you've been disappointed I think you should just give Christ the sincerity 
of yourself and not trying to be, you know, a protocol like how a Christian should be or listen to. Find out for yourself. Yes. That, that's what I would say. Give the Lord a chance. Mm. Open your word, open the Bible and go search for yourself. Yeah. And even enroll at courses, which is a start. That will help if you are really serious about pursuing a better life, a better way of life. Thank you so much, Oling, for sharing your testimony. It's been amazing. I really appreciate it to hear what you had to say. It is amazing how God has been working in Oling's life, how she has come from not having any peace through the problems she has faced to now where God is working within her life in an amazing way and teaching her to trust Him. He can do the same for you if you let Him. I challenge you to open your life to Him and let Him change your life. God does change lives and for that we praise Him.